All right, uh, well, I want to thank you all for being here today, and most importantly, I want to thank the Steamboat Institute for inviting me uh, here to uh, talk about this important topic. I also want to thank uh, you guys for uh, uh, basically making me pack a suit this time instead of my ballistic vest, my helmet, and my gas mask. It's a very nice change of pace. Uh, naturally, uh, this being a foreign policy and national security summit, there has been a lot of attention, deservedly so, on the many problems overseas, um, which continue to deteriorate even as we sit here today. Um, but while we must not ignore the, the chaos in other parts of the world, we also must not ignore the threats stemming from our open border. 263 illegal immigrants over the course of four hours in the Rio Grande Valley at the start of 2021. That was kind of my first introduction to the unfolding crisis shortly after Biden came into office. I've been covering the border since 2019, and seeing the 263 in that period of time blew me away because I was seeing in real time that the tried and true dynamics of what normally happens at our southern border was starting to turn on its head. No longer were illegal immigrants crossing the Rio Grande in the dead of night and trying to hide from La Migra. Now they were starting to nonchalantly walk to try to find border patrol to turn themselves in. This reached a crescendo when I was in Yuma, Arizona the following year because so many people were illegally crossing into Yuma County from all different parts of the world. Uh, Border Patrol, their leadership, told their agents to not go to the crossing points and to stay away from the border because they could not take any more people due to the fact that their holding facility was over capacity by thousands of people. This resulted in people who had just crossed waiting by the border wall for many hours and in many, some cases many days. So they got fed up. Illegal immigrants started to walk into town to try to find the border patrol station in, in Yuma. And I followed one such group. And uh, it was pretty interesting. As they were making their way into town, they stopped by at a McDonald's <laughs> to get food. Uh, but once they reached their destination and once they reached the sign that said that they had finally reached Border Patrol, they started to celebrate. They started to take selfies, they started to make calls to family and friends, informing them that they had finally made it. They then walked to the side of the building, knocked on the door, and a Border Patrol agent answered and he had to take them in. And that was kind of the end of that. But that's an example of just how ridiculous things had become because instead of illegal immigrants hiding from Border Patrol, it was now Border Patrol hiding from illegal immigrants. Today, the problem has become even worse, which is almost uh, kind of crazy to say, but it's true. Uh, now it is common, because remember, we started at 263 over four hours. Now it's common to see 1,000 people cross at one time in broad daylight, often with Border Patrol watching either from the riverbank or on a boat to make sure that they don't drown. I've always said that the women and children, and now the military-aged single adult males, giving themselves up to law enforcement has always been the easiest part to see about the ongoing crisis. The more nefarious aspects are harder to see, and that's what brings us to the title of my speech. The threats to our homeland are very real. Each time Border Patrol is overwhelmed, which is now often and in many places at the same time, that hundreds of miles of our southern border are left unguarded. They might be being monitored, but they're left unguarded. Anyone who pays the cartels or the coyotes, to avoid Border Patrol have never had an easier time sneaking into our country. Now, I do want to be clear. The southern border has never been truly fixed. It has never been truly sealed. And I'm not saying it was all sunshine rainbows with Purple Dragon sing-along friends before Biden entered into office. But what I am stressing is that the border is much worse off now, which in turn means our country is worth much more worse off now. And it's directly because of the policies being pursued by the current administration. So let's look at the numbers then. In fiscal year 2021, 15 people were apprehended by Border Patrol who ended up popping on a terror watch list. Fiscal year 2022, that number jumped up to 98. And this recent fiscal year in 2023, Border Patrol apprehended almost 200 people who ended up being on the terror watch list. Now, of course, the key word is that they were intercepted. They were the ones that were caught. We don't know. We truly do not know how many people, either that are hardened criminals or on a terror watch list, were able to evade apprehension, because like I said, it's never been easier to do that. 
uh, in the time that Biden has been in office. I think it's even more stark the fact that the FBI director recently testified to Congress that in addition to the border and all the events happening all over the world, he's never been more concerned about the threat to our homeland. And he said that every alarm in his system is blinking red. So when it comes to the threat of terrorism stemming from our southern border, the conventional wisdom has always been that Mexican cartels would not knowingly help a terrorist across our southern border because should an act of terror be committed and it gets back to them, they knew that the consequences would have been dire because naturally we would respond as we should because then at that point it hurts their bottom line because ultimately they want to make money. But today they don't have that fear anymore because they know that they have all the power with the fact that we have a weak administration and Mexico continues to devolve into a narco state. One of the reasons why the cartels have that power is because of how much more money that they are making only you know, simply through human trafficking and human smuggling. During the Trump administration, it was estimated that car the cartels were collectively making around $500 million a year just through human smuggling and human trafficking. Today, they're making an estimated $13 billion just through that illicit activity. Uh, the House Judiciary Committee, the, just earlier this month, they revealed that in the Del Rio sector, which is where Eagle Pass, Texas is located, and I'm sure you've heard much about Eagle Pass recently, the smuggling networks in that region make $32 million a week just from the people that are crossing illegally, which of course makes me think that I'm in the wrong business. But the cash infusion from the cartels that are getting are directly because of the Biden administration's policies. It has supercharged their war against Mexican security forces and have allowed them to expand their operations here in the United States. And make no mistake, their operatives are here in all different parts of the country. So, this is a little bit of a warning, that should the U.S. take more kinetic action against the cartels for, let's say, being foreign terrorist organizations, as some politicians have suggested, we must not underestimate their ability to fight back in both Mexico and the United States. As I just said, their people are already here. And if given the orders and if backed into a corner and if they, they feel threatened, they have, would have ample, ample opportunity to carry out the atrocities that we typically see in Mexico here in our own backyard. That's not to say that they're unstoppable, but when they're making as much money as they are now, they definitely have the means to fight back. But the thing is, they're already committing horrific crimes against our fellow citizens. And in a way, the national security for our homeland in regards to the border crisis manifests itself in two ways, in public safety and economic stability. Part of our national security simply means keeping our citizens alive and safe. That's not, unfortunately, being met with the record and horrific levels of deaths stemming from the fentanyl crisis. Now, defenders of the Biden administration have tried to say, well, fentanyl, the issue of fentanyl, and illegal immigration, those are two separate issues because most of the fentanyl that's being interdicted is being interdicted at the ports of entry, upwards of to 90%, to which I say, duh, of course, when you have people along, port, along parts of the border permanently stationed where they have the manpower and they have the technology to intercept drugs or people going through a port of entry, of course you're going to intercept a lot of illicit activity there. But as I've mentioned, when you have border patrol who guards between the ports of entry, and they are pulled away from the line because they are being inundated with people who are willingly giving themselves up, drug cartels are gonna use that to their advantage. Because remember, we're talking about fentanyl pills here. This isn't the 80s and 90s anymore where it's marijuana, loads, and bricks of cocaine. You can fit 500 pills into a backpack and it's much easier smuggling that in between the ports of entry across the rugged borderlands. So, of course, when we have that in combination with everything else, of course, I mean, even though we're intercepting much more and higher amounts of fentanyl, we're still not seeing a decrease in deaths. So the fentanyl is coming in from somewhere, right? So they are very much the same issue, also just the simple fact that the cartels are involved in both of those 
trades. It's not one cartel focusing on just fentanyl and one cartel focusing just on human smuggling and human trafficking. They all work together because, as I've said, their main goal is to make money. Now, national security also just means having stability, having peace. Sanctuary cities across our country are experiencing the destabilization that has been ongoing since the 2020 BLM and Antifa riots. In addition to US citizens taking advantage of the soft on crime policies, the process and release migrants are quickly joining the criminal underworld. That is why there is such strong pushback from within deep democratic districts whenever a city or jurisdiction says we're gonna house these people in your backyard. One of the things that manifests itself in is has been, there's actually been kind of a bit of gang and race wars in the shelters in let's say New York City between the African migrants and the South American migrants. It's really fascinating. But unfortunately, it does directly affect the US citizens. There was a case out in Maryland early, early on during this crisis where someone who was, who was able to illegally enter the country under this administration who went on to kill and rape a, a teenage girl. Her mother just recently testified uh, at Congress to talk about how if they actually had the ability, Border Patrol actually had the ability to do their jobs, her child would still be alive today. And then there was another case uh, last year in Texas. A little bit different because this time the alleged murderer gave himself up in El Paso to Border Patrol. Well, how did he get into the, into the country? Well, at the time, he was 17, and he was alone. So he was considered an unaccompanied minor. And so the Biden administration processed him, and then they let him go. And then within, within the year, he raped and killed, uh, I believe the girl was eight years old. After he was done, he stuffed her body in a trash bag and threw it underneath a bed before he went about his life as if nothing had happened. But it goes beyond just the physical safety, right? We don't, even, we don't even have to look very far about the economic devastation that this crisis has. We could just need to look at Denver. Uh, just this month, Nine News reported that Denver is preparing to spend about 10% of its general budget just on the migrant crisis, which equals to about $180 million. Denver will also pay one month rent for migrants who are working and three months for those who aren't working. That's a great deal. But worse than that, but worse than that, the hospital system in the city is nearly on the brink of collapse because they have been stuck with a $136 million bill for services rendered to migrants who haven't paid back. And we were seeing that already last year in the border hospitals. I was with a congressional delegation in Yuma, Arizona, uh, getting firsthand from the staff. The staff were willing to, which is very rare because you know, they're pretty guarded about that stuff, but the problem had gotten so bad for them that they wanted not just the media, but members of Congress to hear what they were going through. Uh, they were stuck with around, two, uh, at the time, $26 million uh, in debt for services rendered to all the illegal uh, immigrants. And the stories that we were hearing from the staff was incredible uh, because you know, well, how are these bills are so high? Well, it's not just, they're not just dealing with cases of dehydration or broken bones. Uh, a lot of the people that are coming through, this is the first time they're receiving world-class medical care. Um, some of them have never been to a doctor at all. So they have uh, heart disease. Some of them needed dialysis. Uh, just in the maternity costs alone was very staggering because a lot of the women that are coming here are pregnant. Uh, after the babies are born, they don't release them right away they, because since a lot of them didn't even get the prenatal care uh, prior to arriving to the States, there's a lot of complications for both the mother and the baby afterwards. And so they actually had to basically set up a hotel for the mothers and the newborns in a different part of the hospital. Uh, and it, it got so bad that American citizens either had to uh, reschedule important medical appointments or they had to go two and a half hours away to Phoenix because the hospital was overwhelmed. Uh, in Eagle Pass, a much smaller uh, jurisdiction, they were in the hole, I was told by Congressman Tony Gonzalez who represents the district, uh, they were in the hole about a million dollars by September of last year. Now, that doesn't sound a whole lot, but for a small jurisdiction like Eagle Pass, Texas, that is basically $100 million to them. And what's not being discussed 
is the fact that we are going to have a new generation of DACA, essentially. And that, you know, the, the first generation, we've barely even been able to figure out what to do with that. And you know, let's say a Republican takes back the White House you know, after this election, they're gonna have to deal with four years of this, of this mess. And so I'm not to say that it's gonna be impossible for them to you know, maybe even four years to fix what's gonna be happening, but you can be sure that should, uh, you know, let's say the biggest deportation operation in US history, there's gonna be the lawsuits, there's going to be mobilization from the far left to disrupt those operations. Um, it, it's, it's going to be an uphill battle, and that's of course if a Republican takes back the White House, which is not a guarantee. But another reason why the national security implications are so stark is just simply the fact that the current administration and Democrats uh, don't want to solve the problem. Um, and I'm not solely blaming just that party. Republicans do share some of the blame on that. But when you look at what's being proposed, the Democrats are just simply proposing that we just need to spend more money. We don't need to actually do anything about it. That's what sanctuary city mayors are saying. They don't, they're not saying that we want the border to be closed. We just want more federal money to help us out. The, the hospital system is asking for a bailout right now. Uh, but what, I, what I've been saying and what I really want to stress is that this isn't happening to us. Uh, it is being done to us. Uh, classic example is at the very beginning of all this, uh, President Biden named uh, Vice President Harris uh, as the borders are. And she was going to fix, she was going to fix this ir irregular migration by addressing the root causes in Central America. Sounds good, right? But the problem was, is that it ignored the changing dynamics that was happening because, don't get me wrong, I mean, I know what I look like, I know what my name is, and throughout my reporting on this, on this issue, I've been called a race traitor, I've been called, uh, you know, I was like, oh, I, I wanna come in and sl slam the door on the way, you know, prevent other people from coming in, and to which I always say, well, first off, I'm American, so let's just, <laughs> let's just get that clear, but also, it's not Mexicans that are, coming over. I mean, we're, I, I've met people as far away as Uzbekistan and Russia and, and India, and we're getting people from, from Africa. And so even, let's say, by some sheer miracle that the vice president was able to address the root causes, which, by the way, they're the root cause of this current influx, there would still be the issue of addressing the rest of the world that's coming. And I saw that in Yuma, because typically, with how the routes go, uh, typically the Central Americans go to Texas and the rest of the world essentially gets funneled through uh, California and Arizona. But that to me was raising the red flag that even though it, it, it was appearing that they were trying to address what was going on, it, it was completely ignoring the actual facts of what was happening on the ground. And then secondly, uh, the vice president just simply refuses to do the job. Uh, it, both Guatemala and Honduras have both said that they haven't spoken to the vice president uh, or even her staff in many months. So I mean, it's just pretty much on the back burner for them. And we, we see the, the weak leadership, and I know Secretary Pompeo was talking about uh, deterrence, and to a, to a larger extent, that's, that's exactly what has happened with our board. We've lost our deterrence, and more importantly, we've lost the ability to actually have the country stand up to these other countries that are allowing this to happen because they view it as America's problem and they get to collect money on the side from it as well. Which is, so when the administration recently met with, with the Mexican government uh, in Mexico City, the, the Mexican government had the gall to tell us to say, you need to give 10 million people amnesty. What? I mean, do you think that would have happened under the Trump administration? I mean, they might have asked, but the answer probably would have been different. But that's, but that's, but that's where we're at. The, the, the entire world knows that they can take advantage of us, either through this migration pattern or through their governments. And then, of course, we have, as I was mentioning before, the race card. Uh, Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett at a recent hearing about the border uh, said that Republicans are targeting communities of color whenever they send buses of uh, process and release migrants uh, from the border to their sanctuary cities, to which, uh, of course, it's, you no, know, that's, that's not what's happening. Uh, whenever there's the pull factor coming from not only the United States, you know, the federal government, but are coming from these sanctuary cities that are offering the monetary services and not giving all these benefits, uh, of course, that's where they're going to want to go to and, and settle. It's not, you know, part of the reason why this whole uh, accusations of, of Governor Abbott kidnapping these people and sending them on buses. No, they, they, they sign waivers and, and they tell Texas, this is where we want to go. And Texas is just simply saying, okay, here, 
you know, we don't, <laughs> this is, we don't want to deal with you right now. But, but this is kind of how unserious the, you know, the response has been from, from one side. But the problem is that the, secu the, the security of our country and just how we, just how we know it to be is, is, is under threat. So I really want to also emphasize that we have to put America first. I understand that you know, this is a foreign policy uh, summit, and I'm not saying that we should completely abandon uh, our place in the world, but we, and I think a lot of you guys would agree here, that we have our limitations, where we don't have infinite resources. We, uh, we have serious issues at home, uh, independent of, of the border crisis and its lasting effects. Um, you know, we, we, we can't solve the world's problems at the expense of our American citizens. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, that yes, the situation is bleak, not gonna lie, uh, but the good news is, is that people are paying attention. Because at this point, it's, it's, it's gotten too hard to, to ignore. Um, it was often used by members of Congress in 2021 that every state is a border state. And if, you know, that was kind of met with groans because it kind of sounds cheesy, and it's, uh, that's just another kind of you know, political line. Um, but it was, it was true back then, don't get me wrong, but it's especially true now, uh, which is why, I mean, you even have, like I said, you have uh, Democrats in, in these deep blue pockets saying, we don't want, we're like, stop sending, stop sending them to us, please. Um, and with the Iowa caucus in that recent voting, the exit polls for the motivation to, to vote and why they were voting the way that they did was because the border and immigration issue was their number two issue right behind the economy, which, as I kind of laid out, is also affected by the border. Um, you know, will, will it be enough to change the voting patterns? I honestly thought it would in the midterms. Clearly, that didn't really pan out. Uh, but it, it kind of reached a breaking point uh, during the summer this past year, so I'm, I don't know. But the fact that a large, you know, it's not just Republicans saying that we need to close the border, um, that kind of gives me a little bit of hope. So, you know, as for me <laughs> and my role in all this, uh, I'm going to continue staying on the topic because it's definitely not going to go away. Uh, this year, in fact, I, I think it's going to get even worse uh, if, it, if that's even possible, and just because since people know that there could be a potential change in administrations, uh, there's going to be a rush of people to that who have been procrastinating, waiting for an opportunity. They, you know, they, they might think that the gravy chain is going to be closing pretty soon. So um, who knows? I think, uh, I think I'm going to be back down there quite a bit uh, this year. So uh, I want to, uh, again, thank the Steamboat Institute for so much for, for having me to talk about this and to provide my insights. I look forward to your questions. That, that, that was great. While we're getting the podium cleared, uh, I'd just like to know how many of you use Substack? Can you please uh, raise your hand? We've got a few over here, a few over here. Okay. Well, um, for those of you who don't, or if you've never heard of it, um, please, please ask us because um, you can subscribe to get the real news on the border, and this is really the only way that you're going to get it is with someone like, uh, someone like Julio. So, Julio, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, there were several things that you said that I, I think we don't hear a lot about, um, that Kamala Harris hasn't talked to her Central American counterparts in months, that hospitals are being overwhelmed. Um, is there another angle of this story, which is, as you say, a very complex, multifaceted story, um, that this audience and the people who are watching us, uh, uh, who are streaming, that they should focus on? So it's not so much a national security thing, but one of the reasons why I'm personally just against illegal immigration, just outside the, the you know, you need, a, you need to have a border, you need to have control of it, is just that the, the, the first victims, and usually the longer lasting victims of illegal immigration are the migrants themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that we've seen that with the, the explosion in unaccompanied minors coming to the border. Because I, rem I remember uh, Secretary Morricus very early on, he said, yeah, if a child comes by themselves to our border, we're not going to turn them away. Well, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? Uh, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of crying over the the, the Trump policy that separated families, uh, but here we have families all over the world voluntarily separating themselves from their kids, sending them on this dangerous journey that, if they make it, uh, then get put into health and human services who have now lost, I mean, at this point, it's probably 100,000, but the last reported number was close to 90,000 unaccompanied minors 
are, are, are missing. Or, you know, they're, the, the U.S. government has no idea where they are or what they're doing. That's a national, I mean, that's shocking. That's a shocking number. It's, Why it's, don't we see that every night on television? It, it's, it's hard to comprehend. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's, and it's the fact that even whistleblowers within HHS, they were retaliated against trying to either bring attention internally or externally. Um, that, I think, that, that, that's, that's very disturbing. And, and again, it's being allowed. It, this is all self-inflicted. You know, this, this doesn't need to happen. You know, again, the border, the border is going to be you know, the, way, you know, the way it is for just because of how we are as a nation. But we don't have to put accelerant on this fire. But that's exactly what's, that's exactly what's happening. Well, thank you for your questions. I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of them on this topic. Um, do you think the, and so I'll just go down the list, do you think the economic stress in cities, particularly Democrat-led cities, is starting to shift public opinion there? What is your reporting shown? No, yeah, I, I think so. And, that, and that's why I was, I was thinking that it would have happened in the midterms, but it, we hadn't reached kind of that, that stress point yet. It really did explode uh, this, this past summer. I mean, we, you, you have, I mean, you have protesting groups entirely, I mean, you have, if you've ever seen these, these, these town hall meetings about this in, in black neighborhoods in Chicago or New York City, I mean, you, you have historically Democratic voters sounding like they're, straight, they're coming right from a Trump rally, of, you know, saying build a wall and we don't want any more there. Um, now, again, is that going to be enough to, because this is generational, you know, voting, voting pattern and, and thinking. Um, I think, I think we will see a shift. It's just a matter of whether or not it's going to, you know, do I think Chicago's going to turn red? No. But it, it's, hard to, it's hard to ignore when you, see these, when you see people who aren't U.S. citizens, aren't taxpayers, they're getting all this stuff, they're being put in your backyard, they're causing all this chaos and mayhem. I mean, every time that they, they see an uptick of, of local thefts, of prostitution, of drug dealing, because people, they want to make money now that they're here, um, I mean, Chicago is dealing with uh, not just U.S. citizens and with the with the retail theft and, and you know spontaneous looting, but also the migrants are getting in on it with with Colombia and and, and uh, e even in uh, California, there's there's a problem with Chilean gangs targeting upper class homes, and and, and they're very sophisticated and they know what they're doing. Um, so I, I guess maybe you know if you get robbed <laughs> one or two too many times, you might say, okay, well I'm gonna go the other way, but. Uh, I think just on the, again, just on the economic factor alone, which is always not the number one issue, uh, I, th I think a lot of people are, are going to say, well, you know, this can't continue for another four years. So uh, one of the questions that's coming from the audience is, how do we understand the thinking behind the Biden administration? Why do they say uh, that they've imposed these policies? And what have you gleaned when you, I mean, I presume as a reporter, you know, if you criticize them, you're calling them up for comment. What do they say to you? What's, what's their point of view? Well, they always say that they're, they're doing their best to have a safe, orderly, humane process uh, at the border, which is completely false uh, on so many levels. I can it will be here for, for a long time just talking about that. But ultimately, what it, what it boils down to, because people, a lot, you hear a lot, well, well, they just want to import new voters. They want to kind of... You know, that's, that's the big reason. And I, I, don't get me wrong, I think that's a reason. I think, I think that's more of a long-term strategy. But, but really, the short term of it is, is just that they just want to be the opposite of Donald Trump. Um, because as good as Trump was moving the needle within Republican politics to, you know, to really campaign on, on the border and the wall and all this stuff, it also shifted the needle for within Democrats. So even if you know, Biden, you know, for whatever reason, doesn't make it to, you know, to, to the general election, and it's Kamala Harris, or, or you know, any national Democrat is going to still carry on those policies simply because we just have to be the opposite of Trump. You know, if he's for it, we're against it. If he, he refuses against it, we're for it. And it, 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 we see that in other aspects of, 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 their, of their policies, but, but especially when it comes to uh, the issue of the border, that, I mean, because they, they view it, again, classic racism, colonialism, and, and just all this stuff, and we, we, can't, we can't do that anymore, and especially in the aftermath of 2020. I mean, that's another reason why. So here's another question. Does either House of Congress have a proposed bill that you would like to see passed? And I would also add that in the budget negotiations that have occurred in these last days, it looked like Republicans had gotten the White House 
um, to agree to take a certain tougher stance on immigration. So are the politics maybe changing on the federal level? And address that question about bills in, in Congress. Well, uh, the, so the Republican you know, Congress, they did pass HR2. Um, they, I, I think that's a good start. But really, the, the, the issue, it, it's, it, it's, not a, it's not a legislative problem, at least the, the, the acuteness of it. Yes, the immigration system does need an overhaul, and that goes through Congress. But to address the current problem, it, it's, it's not stemming from Congress. It's stemming from the executive branch. That's, that's the problem. But also, I mean, with, with the Senate negotiations, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, they, they were you know, the Republican side of it, and this is what I was saying, this is where the Republicans are to blame for, they're, they're talking about increasing the number of work visas each month. And, to, and I mean, that, that alone is a pull factor, e even more so because, you know, when the, the cartels and the, and the smuggling networks, they're very good at either, either being honest with what's happening and being proposed in Congress, or they do twist it. Um, because you, you see, you have Democrats saying that, oh, well, Republicans are to blame because they're saying the border's open. It's like, well, no, they're not watching Fox News. Uh, they're, in their, they're in their WhatsApp, they're in Facebook, and they're, they're in these group chats that, that advertise them. Uh, so it's just, th there, could, there could be more things, that, uh, sure, that Congress can do, but, to, to, but to, to stop this huge flow of people that is unprecedented in modern history, you just need to, I mean, I mean you know, remain in Mexico, would be a good start. Um, not even, I mean, sure, you, can, you could start building the wall and you can have the infrastructure, but really, uh, when you, whenever I've talked to Border Patrol agents, it's just that we, need, we just need the policies to go, to go back the other way. Right, and I, I should add, too, that while Remain in Mexico was quoted a lot, um, and the lifting of it is one of the issues, we also had agreements with Central American nations as well that were also important. Um, so there were a suite of policies that, yeah. that were necessary. There's not kind of one big easy, easy fix. This is an interesting one. Um, do the politics, the shift of Hispanic voters to the GOP, does that complicate the politics of immigration or does it simplify it? Well, I, 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 I define, define complicated though, because it, it's, it's really simple. Is it harder or easier to find compromise to, to, to fix the border? I, I, again, I think a lot of people, so for example, when I was going to, to Eagle Pass, my, my mom, who is originally from Mexico, and I was telling her, oh yeah, I'm going back to Eagle Pass uh, this week, and she said, she said, you have to call it an invasion. You, you have to, you, you, no, no, hardly anyone's calling, you have to call it an invasion. And I'm like, okay, yes, mom. Uh, but, it, 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 you know, she, she's by no means a, a, you know, a diehard Republican or anything, but regular people just see what's going on, and they, they're, they're, they're not, Stupid. I mean, they, they know that this wasn't how things were right. four years ago. Uh, a lot has changed, obviously, since since 2020 in more ways than one. But I wouldn't say that it, it, it complicates it. I would say it actually brings more attention to it because, unfortunately, the borderlands, especially uh, overwhelmingly Latino, um, they 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 feel they feel abandoned. They, and I mean, and they have been. They've been abandoned, and because they. Are not the 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 you know the, the center of power for for the Democrats because you know they they've dominated that area for so long, they, they, the Democratic the National Democratic Party has viewed them as acceptable losses, um, and, and yeah so that's why we've kind of seen a shift uh, in, in that I think it's going to take a little bit more time before we even see a complete reversal because again with the midterms I thought it was going to be a much right. I thought it was going to have much greater impact I really did, but we didn't really see that we, right. we didn't really see that there, there's still just because, again, I mean, they've been voting that way for, for many, many years. So I wouldn't say that it complicates it. I would just say that it, it, it still needs to play out right. before, before we truly see kind of the effect of, of, of that. So you've talked about a number of actors here. You've talked about the cartels. You've talked about the U.S. government. You've talked about the Mexican uh, government. We've talked about state governments to a degree, although we should probably explore that too. But there are a lot of charities uh, that are also significant actors here, and I don't think it gets a lot of attention, and I wonder if you could tell the audience and person in the, that are listening in, um, what role are they playing? How extensive are these operations? Are they helping or hurting uh, the effort to uh, deal with this inflow of migrants? Well, they've supercharged it. Um, whenever you hear Eric Adams or, or, or Brandon Johnson from Chicago talking about, well, Abbott's the one that, uh, you know, he's to blame because he's the one that's busting people. And obviously that's true, but when you look at the numbers of, of where they've sent people, because they keep track, 
it's, it's a drop in the bucket. And it's like, well, okay, well, then where are the other people coming from? They're coming from uh, these, these NGOs, these charities, which get federal government contracts, so, you know, our money, to help provide for, you know, the, the, the clothing, the transportation. Um, that, so, I mean, whenever you, I don't know if anyone's flown out of San Antonio Airport, uh, but you go there at any time of the day, and you see, you, you see the entire airport's filled with recently processed and released migrants. Um, and so obviously that's not part of Texas's busing program, right? Uh, sometimes, yes, people do get money from friends or family that are already here, but you know, oftentimes, I mean, these are, these are people who are very poor uh, that are already spending so much money for the trek he to get here. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, this is why... It, who is that? Is that Catholic Charities? I mean, wh who's funding that? It's, it's, it's a, I mean, dozens. Catholic Charities is one of the biggest ones. Um, a lot of it's religious-based, actually. I mean, the Lutheran Church mm -hmm. also has another uh, program. So, but, uh, there, but then there's also just wholly different part, and it, it, it kind of varies uh, along different parts of the border, because California has a little bit different than, the, than, than Texas does. So, I mean... There's a monetary incentive for for these for for the charities to, to to offer these services because they get they're getting so much money through through FEMA. Yeah, you you travel to a lot of different states. Um, again, please subscribe to his Substack. It's it's definitely worth it. I'll put in a plug there. Um, but it's not just Arizona. It's not just Texas, Florida. Many many states are feeling the impact of this. Are there any state um, governments or governors who you have seen as particularly effective? Um, are there models here or that can be copied, or well, is the, it just a mess? And you know, we just need to stop it. And well, it, it, I mean, it's a it's a problem because whenever you see, like, you know, take Texas for for example, whenever they try to do something to try to stem the flow of people coming into their state, uh, the Biden administration takes them to court. Mm. We we've seen that with the, the the floatable buoy system, which you know people said was a death trap. I've seen it. I've touched it. It's not. Um, it, recently, they you know they took over this this stretch of, uh, of of the border that has been a very popular area for people to cross into. They're being sued right now over that. Um, in, in I understand some of the criticism with Governor Abbott because uh, people say, well, he should do this, he should do that. But the problem is you're you're having the state address yeah. a, a federal responsibility, mm -hmm. and when you have the federal government being unwilling to to do what they should be doing. Then yeah, then you're going to have this kind of quagmire. You're going to you're going to kind of have this purgatory almost, where the state is going to do X, but they they kind of they they may or may not have the authority. That's what the whole that's what the whole lawsuits are trying to figure out. I think they do, but I'm not. You know, I'm a college dropout, so I don't. I can't really speak to that. But uh, it, it's 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 un it's just unfortunate that uh, that the the taxpayers of Texas have had to spend all that money to try to do something about it, and and, and they should. I'm not saying that they should just throw their hands up and say, well, we can't do anything. They should definitely try to do something about it. But you know, as we all know, when the federal government wants to get gets its way, it more often than not it will, and so it just needs to have a change. Um, unfortunately, we we don't have any time left, but it, you will be around to answer more questions, and actually, uh, he'll be out in the lobby ready to sign his book, so please, please go out there, and we will reconvene in about 15 minutes, but first, please, please thank Julio for sharing these views. <laughs>